Thank you, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be back in this space again, and especially to be here uh, with Maria. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit um, at the beginning uh, about, about Maria and how I came to know her. Um, then Maria will do a short reading from her book. Um, and then we'll talk for a little bit, a little bit and hopefully you'll join in in that discussion um, after a while. So, uh, Maria Bello um, is a deeply good person. <laughs> and that's a rare thing. Um, she uh, got in touch with me, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this and we'll hear it from her, um, about writing, wanting to write this essay for my column. Um, after that essay came out, which was in November, uh, in February, I was heading out to Los Angeles as part of my book tour uh, for my book, Love Illuminated, and I was involving SAS in these different cities along the way. Um, and in LA, there were a lot of them. <laughs> I think there were 20. And Maria said, um, well, when you come to LA, I'm going to have a party for you. This is, this is from a person who I really only knew professionally and from a couple of phone calls and from publishing her essay. And I said, well, that would be great. I said, please don't feel like you have to. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I was sort of nervous about it. And she was like, absolutely. We'll put chili on and we'll have, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, who will, who will come? And I figured this would be her friends. And she said, whoever you want to invite. And I said, well, I don't really know anybody in LA except for all of these essayists who were going to be participating in this event. I asked all 20 to participate in the event, thinking that half would say no, and that would be the perfect number. And all of them wanted to participate, so we had, we had almost 20 people there. And Maria said, invite them all and their significant others and whoever they'd like to bring to my house. These are all people who I don't know except for having worked with them. Maria didn't know any of them, and none of them knew each other. Um, but she said, whatever, <laughs> bring, bring it on. And uh, we had the best time, and everyone uh, talked. These are people who write for the Modern Love Column. Some of them can be highly emotional people. <laughs> and they all got along, um, and we talked about stories and storytelling and we ate chili, and it was a really good time. So thank you very much for that. You're so welcome. Um, let's hear from, from Maria's book. I love this book. Uh, it was, it was um, personal, and use the personal to talk about the political, which is the best way to talk about the political, and to hear about someone's life from the inside and how her choices affect her outlook. Um, and I had such a good time reading it, and I can't wait to talk about it. But it's best for you guys to get a taste of it first. So let's hear what Maria would like to read. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Daniel. I, um, I'm so honored that you're here. Of the 50,000 entries that you get, you've got over a decade, <laughs> I happen to be one that you picked, and that's pretty cool. Um, I want to say, when I wrote the essay, I wrote it... Um, the night of my son's father's, who's now my dearest friend, his 50th birthday party, and my parents flew out for that. My mom is here tonight. And my brother was there, and Jackson and my uh, romantic partner, Claire, who was my best friend, now, da -da, and, <laughs> and it's all fluid. Um, and Dan's whole family and friends, and I felt so much love in this room and really thought, I have so many incredible partners in my life, and without them, I would be lost. So I wrote it in one night, and I thought, where would I publish this? And of course, literally, the first thing I go to when I read the New York Times every Sunday is Daniel's column, and um, been so moved over the years by so many of the essays. So I went, I, ne I need to get in touch with him. I did, within an hour, he called me and said, are you sure you want to publish this? <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I want to publish it with you because it was more than sexuality. It was my 
the idea of labels and, and, and partnership and family and how that's changing and what it meant to me. And I had no idea that it was, would turn out to be such a larger conversation. And then within the first hour, we had 273,000 or something Facebook things saying, I'm a whatever and I never knew what to call it. I have a whatever family. I have a whatever religion. And so I felt um, a responsibility in a way to continue to ask these questions and, and um, open it up for other people to ask their questions. Um, so one of the chapters that I'd like to read tonight, I, I was trying to figure out a one to, read, one to read, and then I thought, okay, we're in DC, um, a lot of political people, a lot of activists, um, so I thought you might understand this one, or like this one, hopefully. Okay. Chapter seven, am I a humanitarian? Demon Gaimon, or There Are Mountains Beyond Mountains. Are you a person who lives to promote human welfare selflessly? I had a mistress once. For years, I thought of her every minute of every day. I would wake in the middle of the night, and she was the only one I could see. I would lie awake for hours, trying to think of ways to soothe her, bring her relief, and how better to love her. During the day, I spoke to her. Now, four years later, I think of her much less. But on our anniversary, January 12th of every year, there is an ache deep in my chest, and I long for her. Let me clarify. I was introduced to her many years ago. January 12th, 2010 was the day I wholeheartedly, undoubtedly fell in love with her. After that day, I could no longer resist her raw beauty and violent, extreme love. She wanted me, she needed me, and I gave myself to her, not knowing that it would be the end of life as I knew it. She was mysterious. People either loved her or hated her the first time they met her. She was dark and angry at times, but there was a softer, radiant side of her too. Only certain people were able to see that side, and not because they looked for it, only certain special souls were able to hear the siren's cry of this mistress. And as in the German myth of Lorelei, the siren lured sailors to crash on the rocks with their beauty and songs. Some survived and some did not. Those who did got a glimpse of her heaven. For years, I gave everything of myself and she took it. Eventually, I began to hate her, her draw, her sex, her death. She was a force I could not fight. And the only people who could help me heal from the wounds she caused were those who had been intimate with her as well. Two years in the middle of our tormented relationship, I was limping and barely breathing, but still going back to her. Haiti was my mistress. The first time my foot hit the ground in Haiti, I knew I was in trouble. It was two years before the earthquake, and my dear friend Paul Haggis invited my boyfriend, Bryn, and me to go to see the amazing work that his friend, Father Rick Frechette, was doing there. We've all heard the expression, a place is just a place, after all, but I don't believe that. Haiti was like no place I'd ever been, and I was glued to her from the moment on. Now my Haitian friends explain this instant connection to me, telling me that I was taken in by the voodoo goddess Erzuli, Erzuli is the mother symbol in voodoo, the caretaker and lover, but also the destroyer and protector. Whatever it was that grabbed me, I knew that I would be connected to this island forever. I was smitten. The smell of diesel fuel and dust mixed with the sweet salt air was the same as South Africa, and the airport teeming with porters, aid workers, and dark faces looked just like the airport in Zimbabwe. The heat hit me with its energy when I stepped out of customs, what I saw before me took my breath away. Local buses buzzed around the parking lot where men grabbed at our luggage. The buses were small pickup trucks called tap-taps covered with colorful paintings. Swirls of blue, purple, red, and yellow assaulted you in hand-painted images of famous people or sayings. There was Aristide with his hands outstretched to poor children and a Virgin Mary who happened to look just like Erzuli. The best one I saw was a picture of Sylvester Stallone as Jesus Christ. 
We rode up the hill in the back of a pickup truck on pockmarked roads teeming with people. We passed hundreds of tiny cement buildings, many wrapped in banners, advertising Lotto. It was like the buildings were wrapped in hope. These banners were everywhere. Every person in Haiti was willing to bet on becoming a millionaire, it seemed, even if they had to spend 25 cents on a ticket when they only made $2 a day. There were just as many beauty salons advertising their expertise on painted portrait signs hanging outside. Beautiful, dark, medium, and light-faced men and women with braided, long, or short hair graced the signs, each offering a brand new life if you went inside. I loved the sounds of Creole spoken loudly, the laughing and the haggling at the tiny stands selling Wrigley's chewing gum, Fanta, and Coke. Art filled every corner, paintings of Haitian women dancing, of Haitian men working the fields, wooden sculptures of entwined men and women, and colorful symbols of voodoo gods and goddesses known as veves, sewn with brightly colored sequins. A few miles farther down the road, we saw rusted tin shacks and old pieces of wood heaped together to form a home for a nuclear family, extended family, a chicken, and a goat. The smiling children I captured on film were playing on a heap of garbage in an open sewer. Their mothers were washing their pots to cook their dinner in the same water. We ended up hours later in Pechonville. I, find my, I found myself in an entirely new landscape, one lush with vegetation, fine restaurants, and fancy homes. At every corner, no matter which part of the town I was in, I was assaulted with joy. On January 12th of 2010, I was sitting in a room with a couples counselor. Bryn and I had been seeing her for months, knowing that our romantic relationship was ending, but not sure how to actually finish it. She had us draw diagrams of our families of origin to see why we were afraid of intimacy. She made us hold each other in strange yoga poses and breathe together when we were in the midst of a fight. It was all pretty ineffectual, to be frank. <laughs> I actually came to loathe the curly, red-haired lady with the pursed lips who dressed like a hippie. On this day, I knew it would be the last time I saw her. I sat with her in the office, alone, while Bryn sat outside in the waiting room on the day we had agreed to finally break up. Right before my session ended, Bryn burst through the door. There's been an earthquake in Haiti, he shouted. I immediately got up and ran to his side to watch the news report on his phone. This beautiful country I love was in ruins, her people screaming and crying. There were 20-something of us on a plane headed to Port-au-Prince six days after the earthquake. We were a motley crew of professional aid workers, Hollywood folks, a tugboat captain, a yoga instructor, doctors, a politician, and a woman who actually brought an entire suitcase with an espresso maker in it, and another large one marked makeup. I can't say everyone had the same reason for going to the disaster zone. Some were excited by the adrenaline following disaster after disaster. Some had seen the news and knew they had to had be of service. Looking out the window of the plane as it descended on the tarmac that day, I did not see the Haiti I knew. There was a film of yellow dust in the sky shutting out the usually bright sun. The bright waters of the Caribbean that I loved seeing upon my arrival were mixed with brown dirt. Everywhere, buildings were half-standing and destroyed. My mistress was dying. The first night, sleeping on the ground under eucalyptus trees, outside of a crumbling old house behind walls, we heard the sounds of grief on the streets. But deep in the night, two of my fellow aid workers awoke to the sound of singing just as the sun was rising. They jumped in a truck to see where it was coming from and followed the voices to a place just up the hill a previously beautiful golf club that was now half-destroyed with thousands of families living under sheets. One of the most beautiful sights I have ever seen was the U.S. Army handing bags of rice down the hill in a line of 50 or so service people at sunrise, like an old-fashioned fire brigade. Below were women in a line peacefully waiting their turn to get their bag of rice, and they were singing like angels. When we asked our translator what they were singing, he said it was a song of gratitude for who was still alive. They could have been singing songs of grief, but instead were thanking God for the gift of life. The soldiers were like angels, delivering kindness and compassion to the weak and weary. 
Those of us who went those first days just after the quake all experienced a deep despair and an incredible joy, feelings that would bond us together for life. In those first few months after the earthquake, I saw the best and worst of what human beings, nature, and I were capable of. I saw moments of grace that I won't ever forget. We were all changed by what we experienced. When I left Haiti for the first time after the earthquake, all I could think about was returning. I put the love I had for the country into the people I met in Haiti. I spent three years pouring my heart and soul into my efforts there. And I, just like the others I worked with, held on for dear life in the face of so much need and devastation. We had our own needs, too. Love, reassurance, sex at the end of the night. Anything to save ourselves from giving in to the grief, solve we could put on the wounds we felt. After days of trying to get medicine to the hospital so that people didn't have their legs cut off without anesthesia, trying to get kids out of the country who had suffered spinal cord injuries, meeting women who were being raped in the camps, and constantly witnessing devastation of all kinds, I was exhausted in body and soul. But I couldn't help but go back over and over again. I believe that if the group I worked with had not fallen in love with each other the way we did and experienced what we did together, most of us would have never gone back. Even I, who had such strong feelings for Haiti before the earthquake, may have stayed away. It was our love for the country, but also our dedication to each other that kept us in her grasp. There were many incarnations of relationships in our group, romantic, business, or platonic, that shifted and changed constantly in those years after the earthquake. We all fought and laughed and drank and made love and broke up and made up and raged and screamed at each other and at the country that seemed to have been forgotten by much of the world. I think when she started to see she was losing one of us to a simpler way of life away from the island, Haiti created chaos and drama between the groups to keep us there. From the hopeful, loving place where we all started, altruistic but drunk with adrenaline, we eventually ended up torn apart and displaced. During my time in Haiti, I fell hopelessly in love with a man who became a driving force in my staying there, and I became that for him. I then developed a relationship with a woman, the beautiful Lolo, who first captivated me with her golden eyes and confident stare. Haiti was a place where emotions came rushing forward. Your heart was raw and open to feeling at all times. <laughs> a group of women and I started the organization We Advance. Our mission started in a tiny yellow clinic in Cité Soleil, the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere. The neighborhood of tin shacks was like the film set of the dirtiest, most devastating place you could ever imagine, with its cesspools filled with rotten water and trash where the children bathed. Out of the Sunshine Clinic, we put Band-Aids wherever they were needed, whether that meant giving out medicine, giving a mother food for her baby or helping a rape victim. Eventually, we realized there were never going to be enough hands or enough Band-Aids. What the women really needed and wanted was an education so that they could help themselves. That network is up and running as We Advance University, the first online educational site for women's groups all over the country. When we needed a break from the Sunshine Clinic, we would head to the beach in Jacmel, it is on the other side of the island from Port-au-Prince, an area that most people never see. It is paradise on Earth. On our days away from the disaster of the city, we would drive through the slums up to the heavenly mountain pass leading to a town that looked like New Orleans, with its artisans and architecture, with interesting people from all over the world. Jacques Mel held the, held the promise of what Haiti could be. On one particular weekend, I drove with friends to Jacques Mel, I was tired from working in the clinic, my leadership skills questioned even by myself. I was getting over a relationship that I enjoyed, but I knew had, had to end. As soon as we arrived at the simple but elegant hut on the beach that belonged to our hosts, I dived into the crystal blue waters with all of my clothes on. I wanted to be healed and to wash away the pain that was hanging off of me from the city. We all needed to be cleansed, but the truth is, it got harder and harder to feel clean as time went by. 
We all hung on, hung on as long as possible. Sometimes our ego's the only thing driving us to say, to stay. Bryn later said that one of the reasons he lived in a tent for two years in Haiti while working at the hospital and building school, a school was because he was trying to prove that he could to others, to himself and to me. And what was I trying to prove? That I could make a difference? That my voice mattered? That I could convince the world to listen to the women of this great country? That I was a humanitarian? I think if I were a true humanitarian, I would have stayed longer and continued to go back, even if almost everyone who I knew and loved had gone. If I, were, if I were a true humanitarian by the definition, a person who seeks to promote human welfare, maybe I would be living in Cité Soleil now. An antonym for humanitarian is selfish. The truth was, I wanted to give relief because I also needed relief. I tried as hard as I could to hold on. I think now that I failed miserably. I was foolish in the way I walked in Haiti with bare feet in the slums, washing children in a dirty pool. I was rewarded with hundreds of parasites that tried to eat me alive. But would I take it back? Could I ever forget the smell, the life, the resilience, the sex, and the generosity? Never. So no, I would not consider myself a humanitarian, nor would I consider myself selfish. I would label myself a human, trying to do my best in this beautiful, fucked up world to make a difference for this country I love, for my friends and for myself. As they say, time does heal wounds, and Haiti has proven she is more resilient than I could have ever imagined. I will be back soon, my love. <laughs> That was beautiful. Um, Thank you. So I'm going to take us back to uh, the start of the start of all this. Uh, the start of all this being this book and the article that led to it. Um, so I had been approached over the years by a few people from Hollywood. <laughs> I won't name any names. It was not Tom Cruise. Um, about writing an essay for Modern Love, and they would always want to talk to me on the phone. I'm not much of a phone person, so <laughs> I'd be like, oh, come on, what do you want to talk about? And what they wanted to talk about was writing an essay, but they just wanted to talk about writing an essay, which is really different from actually writing an essay. One um, is actually productive, and one is a waste of everyone's time. <laughs> and Maria, um, got in touch with me and said, um, you know, expressed her interest in writing an essay for the column and said she wanted to talk to me. And I honestly thought, one more. <laughs> you know, one more. Person. <laughs> and Maria had already written her essay, and she wanted to talk to me because she was concerned about... Um, uh, about the seriousness of the topic and about, like, who was I, you know? Um, and she wanted to find out who she was dealing with. Um, and I really respected that. And the, the essay was written. Um, she sent it after our conversation. And we went from there. And at the time, yeah, I said, are you sure, are you, sure you want to publish this? Yeah. Um, and I want to go back to that. And then you had just said yes. Um, and I didn't really press you more than that. Um, but I, I want to know, um, or to have you talk about just what, um, what led you to the point of writing that piece? And why did you, what, what were you hoping to have happen by publishing it in a place where so many people would read it? And did that happen? Um, it's a great question, or questions. 
I, um, my, my book is really a series of questions more than answers. And when I was ill, I uh, looked at my hundred or so notebooks under my bed that I'd been keeping since I was a kid from a green torn up copy book with little hearts drawn on it from when I was 13 up until the present day. And as I read these, I started questioning like, who was that little girl who was writing love poetry and had this Cinderella fantasy and continued to till I was 40 something? You know, I saw the repetition in it and I also saw, you know, who I was and the pain I was in when I was, you know, before I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I, I also saw the, you know, stuff that happened with my family and uh, was I a perfect mother? And I just started asking all of these questions of myself. And I knew that these questions, um, you know, if I asked them of myself, perhaps other people would ask them. And, and the labels that went with these questions. So I wrote the article because my son, um, when he uh, asked me if I was involved romantically with anyone, and I told him it was my best friend who happened to be like a godmother to him, I didn't know what he would say. And he said, Mom, whether you're lesbian, gay, bi, transgender, or whatever, love is love, shout it out to the world. Couldn't believe this, and he couldn't believe it either. He said, I think we have to lose that part because they'll never believe a kid said that. So whatever we love is love. <laughs> yeah, we shortened it. So whatever love is love. Um, I was so proud of my son at that moment. And then I started questioning the label of partnership and what that meant. And I've been blessed with so many incredible teachers in my life. One of my partners for five years was a 70-year-old movie producer and who was curious about life and a seeker and we had a similar history and we never were romantically involved, but he was the person that I talked to every day. He was the person whose shoulder that I cried on. He was the person who, you know, we had adventures together. And my two friends that raise a daughter and their sisters for 15 years, and aren't they partners too? 50% of America are single. So when you ask someone, do you have a partner? They immediately think of a business partner or somebody you're romantically committed to, married or... And I started realizing when I asked people who was your partner, there would be a little shame about it if they didn't have a partner. And then I would say, but don't you? Maybe a partner is someone you're committed to who is really significant in your life or even an animal. A lot of people have these relationships with their, their animals that are like they're their children, like that's your family. And why shouldn't we be able to celebrate that? Why shouldn't we take away the definition of partnership and create our own labels and what that means? So um, this idea and the idea of the modern family being a more honest family and that it all comes in different shapes and sizes led me to um, writing the article and ask, asking larger questions. And, and what did you hope? How did you hope for people to take it and was it taken that way? And so, sort of what was the reaction um, after it came out? Was it what you wanted and expected? I had no idea how anyone would take it. And I neither really did didn't. I, and, and neither did I. And neither did you. <laughs> we talked about it. We were like, mm. I mean, I felt like I was just proud of my family and wanted to tell the story and make peop people feel not so lonely anymore. But I never would have seen the response. You know, most people told me that they read the article and then saw it was written by me. Oh, really? And I thought that was really, really fascinating. And like I said, then when I started to get this mail and Facebook and you started getting stuff, it was like, wow, there's a larger conversation. And of course, some media outlets boiled it down to sexuality. But for me, it was so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And some people understood that. And as I said, I felt like it was my responsibility to write this afterwards. You know, I, I, was, um, I was surprised by the reaction, but um, almost completely in a positive way, because I, I thought that, it would, that we'd only get the headlines, Maria Bello comes out in, as gay in the New York Times. I, I thought that would be what people would, would seize on. And, um, and there was some of that, but there was more of this... Um, I don't know, something's changed <laughs> recently. Oh, so much has changed. <laughs> and, and there was more of the nuance of um, 
which is the nuance you intended of uh, it's, not, it's about um, loving who you love. Um, and uh, there was the writer Mary Elizabeth Williams in Salon, yeah, who we she both, she's a friend of mine, but she's, um, and she talked about it's about, it's, it's not about the, um, the, the gender of the person who gives you happiness, it's the happiness itself um, that should be celebrated. Um, and I was, I, I didn't give the media and the reading audience enough credit, I guess, um, at the beginning to to have have it be this sort of positive um, sort of rollout that um, yeah. that that it ha had. I, I was I was really impressed by that. So, um, but did you? Um, so you're you're in Hollywood. You're being considered for roles. Um, did did you worry about? And I thought when you talked to me about it that that you really hadn't talked to any of your business people None, about it. Yeah. And so I. <laughs> Um, I thought, okay, well, that's going to be the next shoe that falls. So, um, did you worry about that? Um, and was that, if, if you did, was that worry f founded? Um, how are things? Um, of course, I was worried about it in the beginning, but by the time I wrote the article, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was excited Why? to share. Um, because, again, I was proud of my family and these mm -hmm. relationships and didn't matter which person I was having sex with. It, it's what she said. It was about the happiness itself and the joy itself. Mm -hmm. And um, after I wrote the article and I said it was going to be in the Modern Love, I talked to my publicist and friend Heidi Schaefer, who's here, who's been my friend forever, and my <laughs> look at you, really, <laughs> and my manager and my agents, and every single one of them went, "This is so beautiful. Put it out in the world. It'll help so many people." Mm -hmm. Every single person said that, and I, so I felt. You know, I felt supported in that way, and I have to say, last year I worked more than I, I have for a long time in all different sorts of roles. So, I do think things are changing, and quite quickly. You know, Facebook last year added 51 new gender options besides male and female, like cisgender, binary, transgender, queer. I read these 51, and I went, I'm at least 15 of them. Yeah. And I'm telling you, if you read it, you'll realize you're at least four or five. <laughs> <laughs> I was with my cousin yesterday, uh, Celeste, who uh, came out in her Facebook page saying, I am transgender, um, non-binary, um, she's 17 years old, so brave, mm. and if you have any questions, ask me. So I'm sitting with Celeste yesterday, not knowing whether to say he, she, or these pronouns that different people choose to use, and I was so excited yeah. that she was finding Celeste was finding labels for herself, and um, we're starting a campaign tomorrow where when people have questions about these definitions, um, you can go to Celeste's page and she'll explain it, because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always thought the... Um, so they have different categories um, for relationships, whether you're married, um, well, I don't even know whether single, married, whatever the other ones are, then there's the, it's complicated. <laughs> and I feel like they should get rid of all the labels for relationships, except for it's complicated. <laughs> you know, I feel like that's the or only whatever. it's the only accurate description of every person's relationship. Is it's complicated, so at least from the stories I hear. <laughs> yeah, and you've heard a lot of them, <laughs> and they're all complicated. Uh, I mean, I mean, those kinds of binds, those kinds of uh, it's it's hard to be with people, and it's necessary to be with people, and it's hard to have a lifelong partner, and it's necessary to have those kinds of partners. So it's it's a it's, it's a constant source of of sort of friction and joy. Um, yeah. And it's, but it's what about thinking outside of the box? These tiny little boxes we put things in and realize we do have lifetime partners. It doesn't mean you have to live with them for the rest of your life. Right. It doesn't mean you have to be sexual with them for the rest of your life. But these people, in fact, are your partners. My son will always be my partner. Relationships, as you've seen over the years with your column and with your own family, are fluid. As soon as we start to think that they're static, we're holding on to something and fearful and we need it to be this way because it makes us feel safe. But it's not the truth. The truth is we're all growing and changing. You know, I just went through this thing with Jackson. When he said this, he was 12 years old and now he's a young man of 14. And we really struggled in the beginning of this year because I was still treating him like he was a 12-year-old and we couldn't relate. And suddenly I woke up and went, he's 
he's not that kid anymore. He's changed yeah. and become, and I have to change and become a new, and figure out how to relate in a new way. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing I really liked about your book was talking about how, um, how, how labels are evolving just as people evolve and relationships evolve and what becomes, um, I mean, acceptable isn't, I don't like the word acceptable <laughs> because it makes it seem like there's somebody out there who gets to decide. Um, but what's becoming more mainstream and more commonplace and more embraced? Uh, I wanted to read something that um, is just a paragraph. Uh, an article that I came across in Cosmo. I don't read Cosmo, actually. <laughs> well, apparently you do <laughs> if you have an article. But I, I consume my media like everybody does these days, which is through Facebook. And um, so here was this article linked to from some friend of mine on Facebook. Um, called Why I Won't Label My Sexuality. It's written by someone named Lane Moore, and I can't figure out if that's a man or a woman. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> but, the, um, but I thought of you in, in, in reading this article, and I'll just re read the first paragraph. I've dated pretty much every, every configuration of gender imaginable, but when people ask, I wouldn't call myself bisexual, which is one of the only universally recognized defining boxes we currently have if you're not gay or straight. I wouldn't call myself anything because I don't think any of the boxes apply, not to mention they all come with baggage that isn't super appealing to me. Bisexuals are still largely seen incorrectly as people sitting in chairs in sexual identity waiting rooms until their names are called to go into the straight or gay offices. <laughs> Lesbians are seen as being attracted to women and women only, and never men, not even a little bit, or else you don't count as a lesbian. <laughs> and straight people are seen as people attached to the opposite sex only. And if you're a girl, and you so much as have a crush on a girl, you are gay, the end. <laughs> Who the fuck is this system working for? <laughs> Um, I love that. <laughs> I always say pretty soon LGBT is going to turn into LGBT, A, B, C, D, F, G. I mean, it's going to be so long. So let's just call it whatever. Because um, it's nobody's business anyway. I mean, the, I, I'm, so, I'm curious about this whole idea of labels because, um, I mean, are labels constricting ultimately? Are they, is there an aspect of them that is liberating? Um, we, we just finished a, a, our third college essay contest for, for the Modern Love column. And, um, oh my God, college students are, are so different in their thinking um, than I was as a college student. In what um, way? More open? More... Well, it's this word label. And they, um, the, the, the most common, every, every time we have this contest, there's a, there's a theme that emerges that most of the kids are struggling with. And this year, that theme had to do with, um, with not wanting to call a relationship a relationship and not wanting to call a, a boyfriend a boyfriend or a girlfriend a girlfriend and not wanting to talk about it at all. Um, and this, those ki avoiding those kinds of labels and the prize-winning essay just ran in the paper yesterday and it was called No, no Labels, No Drama, Right? Because that's a phrase that they sort of embrace, that if you have labels, then you're going to feel like your behavior is constricted to what a boyfriend is supposed to be, like right. a boyfriend doesn't cheat on you. Right. <laughs> um, so how, and I'll ask this, this of you as someone who's thought about it a lot, how are labels, how can they be constricting? And when you were young and you were thinking about who you're going to be, did you think in those terms? And was that constricting to you? or? Are there aspects of labels that can be liberating? Um, I think the only labels you should have are the ones you give yourself, the ones that make you feel powerful, that shine a light on the beauty of who you are, make you proud to be part of the community. Um, a woman came to me after the article was written. Um, she was a producer in Hollywood, and she'd always been really mean to me. Like mean, <laughs> like really rude and like whatever. And I mean, I'm sure she was nice to some people, just not to me. 
And after the article came out, we were in a luncheon, and she came up to me, and she hugged me, and she said, welcome to the club. And I went, and she was a lesbian. I'm going, go, I, I didn't say it, but I was like, I don't want to be in your club. <laughs> like, you're mean. I want to be, like, with people who fight. I love, that, I love that part of your book. Right? I want to be with people who, like, fight for who they love and love who they love. I don't care who they're having sex with. Um, and, you know, back, back to your question, the, the whole idea of, the structure of labels and what kids are going through nowadays and the, shif the shifting perception of it. I, I think that um, the, the disempowerment people can feel from those labels and that these mm -hmm. kids are breaking out and saying, I don't know what that means, boyfriend, girlfriend. You know, I, I went back to questioning Catholicism. This was a big thing because I grew up, was raised Catholic. I went to 16 years of Catholic school. My best friend was a Catholic priest at university. And I couldn't consider myself a Catholic as I got older because I thought, well, I believe, uh, you know, that women have a right to choose. I believe that women should be priests. I believe, uh, uh, you know, in marriage equality. So then as I was writing about it and looking at it, I thought the Catholicism I learned from my parents and from Father Ray and from many people was based in love and acceptance. And then I see this new pope coming, and he's all about inclusion. And it's about focusing on poverty and peace as opposed to anyone who they're sleeping with. And um, I was really moved by that, and I have reclaimed the role of Catholicism. I mean, I've reclaimed that label, and I never thought I would. And listen, I've gotten some like things from evangelists, people going like, oh my God, you're the devil because you're not really Catholic, but guess what? Yes, I am. There's room mm -hmm. in every great religion for uh, different points of views and different minds, and I am really proud to call myself Catholic now. Um, one thing I liked in this in this book, um, and you all should read this book. It's such a it's such a sort of human human book. Um, but you talk about uh, two father figures in your life, or I think of them as father figures. This. Um, Father Ray and John Calley. Is, Cal is am I pronouncing it right? Yeah, John Calley. Um, so you, um, Maria, as a, probably as a freshman at Villanova, was having lunch every day with um, <laughs> this Father, Father Ray. Ray in the cafeteria. I thought that was such a, you're such a, um, you have such an explorer sort of mindset. You're like hungry for the wisdom of, you know, the wisdom that other people have, I guess, um, and not, not embarrassed in the least to be with, with Father Ray in the cafeteria every day for lunch. Um, so what are, you, what are you seeking in these? Um, I'm, I was curious about those relationships because they seem, both seem so important to you. Um, what, what were you seeking from those relationships and what was important? you know, so crucial about them to you? Um, I've always been a seeker, and my family is the same in a lot of ways, and um, going through some tough times, I was always questioning what all of these things meant, and I have to say my greatest teachers were my parents. I saw them grow and change and go through difficult times and how that affected us and what my parents came from, and um, saw a real humanity in that, and that whole idea of turning your pain into compassion, that was a big part of, of my life, and healing, and forgiving, and what that meant, and forgiving myself for not being perfect, for not being the perfect mom, the perfect daughter, the perfect friend, or whatever it is, and still working on forgiving that. Um, but the truth is, these other teachers that came along, they were the same, they were curious minds, and as old as they, was, they were, as educated, they were still constantly curious and seeking. And those are the people that I want around me. Those are the people who I love. I mean, I want to point out after I said the Catholicism thing, it's so funny. My, my mom, who's in the audience, my aunt asked her to come um, see her friends who lived in D.C. area. And um, they went. It was a gaggle of like five women, five or six. How many women? eight of us, um, you know, from all different places, but like Catholic, Jewish, blah, 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 and they didn't know how they'd get along. Well, these girls, they call themselves the goddesses now. 
doesn't matter what the name is of the guy you call the name, if you call him Muhammad, Yahweh, Jesus, whatever, it was based in love. And those are the kind of people I, I want to hang out with, and that's who these girls hang out with, and I'm, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I liked in the book how um, you organized, I guess it's a prologue and an epilogue in 14 chapters, and each chapter begins with a question. Um, in my book, I had uh, 10 chapters, and they were organized around questions. And since you have 14, I feel like you're more confused than I am, so <laughs> I made me feel, feel a little bit better. Um, what, what drew you to organizing a book around questions, I guess, is the first thing I want to ask. And, and, the, and, and which of these questions most um, do you find sort of most tantalizing and interesting of the ones of, of all the 14? Um, as I said before, I had all of these journals to work with that I was reading. So I started out, it took me a year to write the book, 600 pages. And as I started out, you and I were in conversation. I said, okay, I think it's about my partners in life and what they've taught me and the lessons that I've learned. But there were so many of them, so much of it. And I, I wasn't interested in writing a memoir. And I kept trying to boil it down and boil it down. And I had friends that helped me to get it down to 300. Then down, you know, and then I was still trying to figure out the structure. And I went, mm -hmm. what is this? What am I actually doing or saying? I'm not giving anyone answers. I realized for me in my life that whenever someone tells me they have the answer, I run as fast as I can because nobody has the answer for me. I realize in the end that I'm whole already and complicated and, I, you know, it's me and God. That's it. That's, that's who I have to figure out. Though I've learned lessons from many, many people. Um, and so at the end, the 14 chapters just came about from the 14 things that I was curious about and that I was questioning and hoping people would question, you know, their own parts of that. And, and the biggest mm -hmm. one was partner and family, really, what I wrote mm -hmm. about with you. Um, and then I would say it was, uh, you know, am I enough? I write about, again, my spiritual yeah. seeking, as I just explained. That was a big one, going to this crazy doctor again after doing 20 years of spiritual seeking, thinking somebody could make me whole and tell me what was wrong with me. And my friend John Cowley said to me, and I write this in the book, in a chapter called, Am I Perfect? At the, end, at the end of his life, he said to me, do you want to know the secret? And I said, oh my God, yes, of course. <laughs> if me. there was anyone who knew the secret, it was him. <laughs> and he said, the secret is, there is no secret. We all walk around thinking that something's wrong with us and that everyone else knows it. But the secret is, you're perfect just the way you are. And from that, I went, oh. And it was a sort of aha moment. Um, but that didn't mean that afterwards I didn't keep trying to find right. someone to make me better. Even uh, a guy, a doctor who told me in the very end of our session, do you know what's wrong with you? And I said, no, tell me. And he said, your face is crooked. <laughs> and I was like, all right. Well, I don't think I'm like a star magazine, like people are putting out like her face is so crooked, you know. Um, uh, so I kind of am stopping doing that, at least for a while. Um, I, I love the parts that you're talking about, at the, um, particularly at the end, because it, the book has a, um, an arc of sort of a journey and of, of gaining knowledge and sort of self-acceptance as you move forward through the, through the book. But then at the end of the book, it's, all, it's sort of perfect in a way because you go to this doctor who... You're, it's almost like you're back at the beginning of the book again, and you're like... Oh, like Oh, just six hundred dollars, and you'll start to tell me, you know, <laughs> what what I need to do and what's wrong with me and all of that. And um, is it Claire who says, almost sort of slapped you on the yeah, face when you get like home? You're, and you're an like, idiot. what are you doing? I thought you were, you know, I thought you were beyond yeah. this by now. Um, but it, you know, it, it's part of that um, that same perspective of wanting wanting to learn from someone who is wise and wanting to. Um, uh, you know, wanting to believe that people know things and that you can learn from them and all of that. <laughs> Being disappointed along the way, but... Yeah. I mean, um, you've learned so much over the years as you write in your book, you know, through these other people's experiences and how that relates to your own life and sort of how to move in the world. And, right. you know, their questioning or their stories help you along and help 
a lot of people along. Right. Um, I'd like to ask just one more question, and then um, I'd like to go to the audience and see what questions uh, you guys have. But what did you, for, for me, um, the process of writing um, is, is a real education, and I go into something thinking I know, um, but it's the writing itself that then teaches, teaches you, and that sort of exploration. So what did you learn in the, in the writing of this book that when you set out, you didn't... Um, you know, what did you learn that sort of surprised you that you didn't expect to learn, or you th you thought you knew something different? And what did you learn in the writing of the book? Well, I've been reading about writing for most of my life. Anne Lamott, Stephen King, writing down the bones. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to do it. I would sit down every day and write five pages, and never never happened. I wanted to be that girl. I was not that girl. I would go two weeks without writing a thing going like, oh my God, I got to write, I got to write, I got to write this thing. And then one night I'd write like 30 pages. Mm -hmm. So I did not do the traditional thing I was supposed to do. Yeah, I don't either. You don't? No. Do you kind of go in the spurts? <laughs> That's just a label that you need to forget about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> or I would have never written a book. Right. And you either, it sounds like. Um, so, I, and, I, and I really understand what you're saying. I let the book lead me in a way. By writing it, it, it came to itself. It's like doing a documentary. People say, you think you're doing a documentary on one thing, and then you find a particular person or an angle, and it becomes something else. Right, and you have to let it go in that. Yeah. You have to follow that. You have to let it go. And um, yeah, it's been an interesting process. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's the hardest thing I ever did, but one of the most freeing things I've ever done. When you, when you sold the book, and this has happened f fairly frequently with, um, with particularly sort of rich columns that some editor will see uh, or agent will see a book in it and, um, and they'll s the, the writer will sell the book and the person will work on the book and it'll come out. But from my perspective, I always, I'm such a pessimist in <laughs> some ways and so I always think like, oh no, now, now she's got to write a book. And when, when Maria sold her book, that was my first thought. And I said to you, don't let them give you a deadline that's too soon yeah. because it's just always so much harder um, than you think it's going to be. Um, but the fact that you pulled this off and... Shocking, it, even I mean, to me, let me tell you. <laughs> really shocking. Well, well, having other responsibilities and family responsibilities and work. So um, I wrote that was kind of amazing. I, 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 was, I, was, I was pretty, I, pretty impressed. I, I, got to, I, I did a movie that Stephen King, uh, based on his novel in the summer, so I actually got to write back and forth with Stephen King, which I thought was the coolest thing ever, mm -hmm. and I said, well, that was a brutal, well, that was a brutal movie, too. It was a brutal movie, yeah, it's called <laughs> Big Driver. Um, and I said to him, okay, so now that I have the book deal, do I actually have to write the fucking book? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, unfortunately, you do. Yeah, the book deal is always much, much more exciting when you first sell the book. Than yeah, exactly. Who, um, who has questions? I think there's a microphone. There, there are mi yeah, microphones um, up here. Thank you. This is wonderful. Um, I'm Terry Nicoletti, and uh, I'm a former Roman Catholic nun. So I love the idea of how you challenge all those other labels, but how do you challenge a label like Catholic, which I gave up thinking I had to, when it means something dogmatically? I mean, there are certain beliefs that it means, and if you can tell me how you did that, I, I would love to hear that, because I, I, it hurt me to give up that label. I bet. Thank you. I bet. I, you know, as I said, I don't have any answers. It was just my own questioning, and... You know, my friend Karim is uh, a Muslim, and he's so embarrassed because 1% of that religion take this book and they, they skew it in a way that, you know, creates these terrorists, but most Muslims aren't like that. And I would say right now 73% of Catholics believe in marriage equality. So things are, things are shifting. Do you know Sister Janine Gramic? I mean, she's a, she's a powerhouse. She's been doing this since the 1970s. 
going to the Vatican and saying, this isn't right. We should let people marry who they want. So if we really boil it down to Christ's teaching about love thy neighbor as thyself and don't take things so literally, which I decided a lot of the doctrine wasn't, wasn't mine. That's not the Catholicism I was taught or believed in. And, um, you know, I don't know where you are in your life, but some of my favorite heroes, a, a gentleman, uh, a priest from Villanova U University came to my reading yesterday in downtown Philadelphia, and he knew my uh, old mentor, Father Ray, and he had written a book, a novel, on um, uh, uh, abuse, priests abusing a kid in the Catholic Church, and actually the priest was gay, like all of this stuff that was inside this novel, and I thought, how progressive we're yeah. getting and how much more <laughs> open. Yeah, so it's exciting, who knows? Yes, so we're on this side. Hi, thank Hi. you for being here. Um, Pleasure. My question is, did you ever consider changing the chapters from questions to declarations? For example, am I a good mom to I am a good mom? Am I, perf am I perfect to I am perfect? Um, I find that there's a sense of power in naming ourselves. I, I name myself as a feminist, a lesbian, as a Jewish woman, and I find that there's a sense of um, power in that in those names because of the rich history and the struggle in those um, in those names and um, what is it what do you think it means for collective movements that are rooted in these labels if we don't claim them I, I completely claim uh, uh, believe in claiming labels that make you feel powerful and a part of a group or a movement but I know a lot of people who are in the LGBT community, LGBT community, who are, in fact, call themselves straight. But it doesn't mean that they're not a part of this community. Um, and so I accept that completely, those labels that I accept. And the reason they were questions to me is because I really had to think about it. Do I own this label? Do I own feminism? Yeah, I own that one. Do I own, am I a good mom? Not so much. I feel like, you know, being a parent, <laughs> If it's that easy to say, I'm a great mom, then I don't know if you're a great parent or not. But, you know, but that's not for me to say. But I really had to question that label and still do every day. You know, when I say my, you know, my dad, you know, back then used a tone with me that used to scare me. Now he doesn't at all. But when I use the same tone with my kid and he goes, mom, you're using the tone, I'm like, oh, my God, here we go again. I'm just yeah. like the worst mom ever. So, um, so it's about what I said before. For me, it's about owning the labels and claiming the ones that make me feel um, uh, powerful, a part of a, a group that I'm proud of. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's, and, and there's, a, there's a power in the declaration, but there's a humility in the question. And I think, um, I think your book is really a humble book, you know? I think you've been through a lot, and, it, and asking those questions is a, is a sort of a tone of humility. It's nice. The humility is, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big part of what I went through when I was sick. I was always the person who, in my family and friends, who was like the A personality. I'm going to do it. I go out on my own. I'm going to fix everybody. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> everybody's going to. And then when I was sick, a humility overcame me where I realized mm -hmm. anything could happen in a moment. And there are people that I need and a humility also that I'm learning now to a different degree, which is, not everyone's gonna like what I write. You know, the humility in saying, I'm okay no matter what, even if people I love don't like it. And that's a, that's a whole new sort of area of humility that I'm dealing with now. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've often said that the, the perfect modern love column <coughs> uh, is a combination of vulnerability and strength. And um, that, that's what this, book is, you know, it's, it's vulnerability because it's full of doubt and uh, personal failings and, um, and trying to sort of trying to make sen sense of things, but, but the act of putting this down and the act of trying to make sense of it and the act even at the end of still wanting to trust somebody else and having to learn that lesson again, um, that is strength. And, you know, often with the column, uh, when people read it and they think, well, I, I, wouldn't, I would never admit to those sorts of, I would never be that vulnerable in public. 
And if you wouldn't, then you're not as strong as the person who would. Um, so that's, that's the power that, that you have in, your, in the column and in this book. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Maria. Hi. Um, my question is... Do you have no more on you? I do. Joyful heart? Yes. Go, Mariska Hargate. <laughs> <laughs> talk a couple times about not feeling good enough in your book. Yeah. How do you overcome that? Because I know I struggle with that more often than not. I, I understand, and I um, continue to struggle with it, but it gets less and less. The more that I'm true to myself, my most authentic self, um, the more that I speak my truth, the more um, comfortable I get with myself. But there's certainly those moments of self-doubt. And, and when I have them, I look at the people around me, the people I love, and I see reflected back to me such incredible people. And I think, why would they be drawn to me if I was such an asshole? And then I, I'm like, OK, I must be doing something right, because they're great. Um, so again, I can't give you any answers, but you seem beautiful to me. And that you are like have no more on you, and you're supporting this uh, amazing cause of stopping, you know, sexual violence and abuse. I mean, right there, it's like, <laughs> I want to be your friend. I'm the one that made the shirt that I sent it to you on Twitter. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I haven't had it printed yet, but I, I designed it. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to say one thing as a follow-up to my Haiti chapter and I write this at the end of the book, I did finally end up going back to Haiti, much to the chagrin of my doctors who were worried about if I ate this food, if I ate that food. But I didn't even go back even in the guise of humanitarian. I went back from, for New Year's to see all of my friends there, to meet my dear friend Caro's one-year-old niece who I hadn't met yet, to go to the beach that I loved, and 14 of us went to Cuba. And I went, you know what? This is my... This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, this is one of my homes, one of my dearest homes. And um, so I saw a different part of Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming to speak tonight. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how what you went through in figuring out how you were like splitting up from your former husband or partner and what that transition was and how you figured out that your former best friend would then become your partner or lover. I, I was interested to see how that happened. For me and for my uh, son's dad, I'm lucky enough that he's a very conscious human being and we decided to put our kid first, no matter what struggle we had. And it took us a while to figure out what this new relationship looked like. And, and it was difficult. And the same with Claire, t because we were so intimate, because we were such dear friends. And, you know, I wasn't used to being attracted to anyone I was intimate with. It had to be like one or the other, right? And um, it was the constant like Prince Charming syndrome of like that push and pull. And I thought that was love. And one day I woke up and I said, who do I like to be with the most? Besides my son, you know, and it was Claire. Um, and that sort of changed everything and made me start questioning and looking at things differently. But for me, if I put the love first, um, then everything seems to work out. And if I accept the fluidity of things, and if someone else can't, that has to be okay too. Mm -hmm. If they don't, if they can't accept the way that you're moving and for me, I'm really trying to learn to let go of that. If I'm moving in a different direction and someone can't move with me, then there needs to be a little separation, maybe. Sure. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Maria. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm a new mom, and as a mom... How old's your baby? 18 months. It's exciting. Yeah, it is. Um, no, it's not. It was horrible for me, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually really good. We're lucky. Okay. And as a mom, um, my partner is transgender, and I'm, we're going to be coming out to my family. Was it easy for you to, once you and Claire got involved, come out? And, you know, did you find love and acceptance, or was it a struggle to choose to come out? 
Well, congratulations. That's so cool. And Thank you. I'm not even going to say brave. I'm going to be like, that's so you. Like, <laughs> you get to be that, right? And they're going to either accept it or not accept it or have questions about it. And some people are going to say, that's great. You know, my mom was telling me the other day, uh, yesterday, a story about her friend who found out that her, um, her husband was a cross-dresser, like so many different labels, um, <laughs> 12 years into their marriage, and she couldn't deal with that. And yet he's married now to a woman who can and loves that about him, and it's, and it's cool. So it's like whatever, um, you know, I would be proud. It's like my cousin Celeste yesterday and the pride she takes. And she said, when I go to college, I want to be an activist. And I said, well, do you want to be one now? Because <laughs> I don't know the answers to these questions. Please answer them for people. And so, you know, you're really a vehicle for change in a huge way. It doesn't, if the close people, you know, don't get it, you know, being in this close circle, you're a vehicle of change to a lot of people in the world. So thank you for doing thank you. that. You're welcome. Thank you so much. That's true. Last question. Hi, thank, thank you for being here. See, this is uh, the height of the microphones is, is not for everybody. You know? <laughs> you different levels that people have to go to those. Um, but I want to thank both of you for being here. And I wanted to ask a question. We use the word love as one thing. And in relationships, love really has two different parts. One is the Cinderella, fall in love, be in love forever, excitement, passion, drive, drama. And then there's a the part of love that you've described with Claire in a, a very long-term relationship and a connection that is not driven as much by the passion but by the connection. And I guess this is a question for both of you. You're also the professional at this. Can you just talk a little bit about how you identify and separate those two different kinds of love and how you merge them, and what hope there is for us as humans who are driven to be with somebody in a moment that is going to go away after some time, whether that's three days or three months or three years. I've been there too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I had an affair with a married man once, and I talk about it in my book, and I, you know, if the statistics are right, maybe half of you had ha have had an emotional or, or physical affair with someone, the statistics. And I was asking myself, when I was looking at a lot of my heroes, at JFK, at Martin Luther King, all these people, I was like, they had affairs, but it, did it make them bad guys? So I start to question that, like, why aren't we talking about that? You know, the very definition of desire is to want something you don't have. So perhaps for some people in a long-term committed relationship, they have the person, and so they look outside their relationship. And I'm not condoning affairs at all. I think it's very, I think sexuality is very, very complicated. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, man, woman, it's complicated. So for me, now I'm getting to the point where I say, can I hold both things, you know, equally in the same hands? Can I, can I hold that I uh, love, uh, you know, love and um, structure and uh, beauty and deep love, and can I hold that I also, at times, have this, like, adrenaline passion thing, and how can I be honest about those two, and they can um, mesh and live in the same place? And, you know, I'm still, I'm still figuring that out, but the more that I question it and talk about it, and talk about it with other people, because so many people are having that experience, um, the, the better I'm feeling about myself. I was, um... When I was on book tour last February, and I was sort of appearing on NPR in each city, and <clears throat> the NPR in Seattle, the, um, the, the woman began the interview by saying, what is love? <laughs> and I honestly said, and I was a little loopy from all the travel, and um, I said, you're, gonna, you're really going to start with that? <laughs> <laughs> How about a few softball questions first? <laughs> and the interview was taped, and I thought they were going to reconfigure it and edit it for it, <laughs> how it aired. And so then I listened to it, you know, online um, a little bit later, and, it, and the interview begins with me saying, you're going to start with that? <laughs> but um, so, so that's the dilemma that I hear more about um, in people who write to me than any other dilemma, and it's that, that transition of 
you know, passionate love to companionate love or what is uh, loyalty and um, appreciation over the long term and people who are either able to make that transition or not make it. And uh, I, I hear from more people in midlife who are dissatisfied um, than almost any other subject. And then more people later in life who um, feel appreciative. Uh, so any, anybody that I'm hearing from, almost sort of 60 on, writes with appreciation about their relationship. People in midlife tend to write with disappointment about their relationship. I, I, to me, um, so much of it is about expectations and the fantasy that we have that passionate love lasts over the long term and that sexual passion lasts and how much we're supposed to be having and how much are other people having. Right. Um, that is on people's minds a lot and I think it's incredibly damaging to, to long-term relationships. Um, you know, feeling like you ought to be um, more sexually fulfilled than you are and not, not sort of looking for what else, <laughs> what's the big picture. Um, but it's a good, that's a good question and it's, a, it's not something where, where I have answers, but it is something that people struggle with. But generally, when people make it through those sort of middle, mid midlife years and come out the other end, they're grateful for it. Any closing wisdom? Um, <laughs> my wisdom is to, uh, to know someone like you who is questioning and you question in public and have other people tell their stories and continue to help people grow. And, you know, I hope with my book that I, I do the same. And I'm the power really, of storytelling. Really yeah. appreciate you being here and doing this. I was so surprised when you said yes. And um, oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.